Okay, shalom everybody, Chag Sameach, Moadim the Simcha. I hope everybody is okay and happy and doing their best to be happy. And we have a special day today. This is Rabbi Nachman's yard site, the fourth day of Sukkot, which is in the Ushpizin, which are the seven supernal shepherds that are guests every day. The guest, the main guest today is Moshe Rabbeinu. And in rest of literature, there's a big connection between Moshe Rabbeinu and Rabbi Nachman in that in the corresponding spherot, the divine levels of energy, there's seven lower spherot, which are Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzach, Chod, Yesod, Malchut. Chesed, number one, they say is Avram Avinu. Gvura, number two, is Yitzchak. Tiferet, Splendor, is Yaakov. Netzach, Victory, is Moshe Rabbeinu. Hod, Aharon. Yesod, Yosef HaTzadik, and Malchut is King David. This is the order that the Arizal lists them. And today is the middle day of the seven days of Sukkot. We count Simcha Torah, Shemini Yetzirah, as a second, as a different holiday. It's a separate holiday. That's why we say Shechianu in the Kiddush of Simcha Torah, because it's considered a holiday in itself, Atzeret. But so the seven days of Sukkot from the first day of Sukkot until Hoshana Rabbah so the middle day is today and like the candelabra the menorah in the temple you had the all the the three and six the the, the three plus three the the candles the first three and the last three were facing the middle candle so too El Mul Pnea Menorah Ya'iru Shiva Tanerot as as great as Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and Aharon, Yosef, and David were, they're facing towards Moshe Rabbeinu, because like Rashi points out in this week's parsha, Vizot Abracha, and the Torah points out, Velo kam navi ke Moshe. There's never be, there, there has never been a prophet and tzaddik like Moshe Rabbeinu, asher diber el Hashem panim el panim, that was able to speak to Hashem face to face. Okay? They had prophecies, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Aharon, and Yosef and David, but not direct like Moshe Rabbeinu, like Rashi points out, that whenever Moshe wanted to speak to Hashem, on the spot he could speak to him. Where do you hear of such a thing, okay? So, the Mida, the attribute, the Sphira corresponding to Moshe Rabbeinu is Netzach. Netzach means something which is eternal. Because Moshe Rabbeinu, working on himself, working on becoming that Tzaddik, he had a victory. The Nitzachon, Netzach translates as victorious. So he was a victory also in that it's eternal. Lo kam navi ke Moshe. There never arose and there never will arise a prophet like Moshe Rabbeinu. And also, ma shehaya hu sheye. That which was is what will be. Ma shehaya hu. The first letter spelled out Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay? Meaning Moshe Rabbeinu is someone eternal. His light, his presence, his holiness, his merit, it's eternal. So the word for eternal, Netzach, victor, victorious, victor. So Nun is 50, Tzadik is 90, Chet is 8. So one, one more time, 50 plus 90 plus 8 is 148. And 148 is the exact numerical value of Nachman, Rabbi Nachman. Nun, 50, Chet, 8, Mem, 40, another Nun, 50, 148. Okay? That's an amazing connection between Rabbi Nachman and the Ushpiza, the, the, the supernal shepherd guest of today, Moshe Rabbeinu. So now, honoring Rabbi Nachman, some interesting, amazing insights on this tzaddik. Rabbi Nachman, in his book, Chaye Moharan, which has been translated in English by the BRI as tzaddik, the book tzaddik, he says himself, Rabbi Nachman, that when trying to daven and invoke his merit in davening, like you're saying Hashem in the merit of Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman himself, while he was alive, suggested that we make mention of his name, son of his mother. He suggested we mention him as Nachman ben Fege, as opposed to the normal common way to mention and invoke the merit of a tzaddik who's passed on, we say the name of the father. For example, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Okay? Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Ben Amram, Moshe Rabbeinu. We normally say the name of the person and the son of the father. Okay? 
And Rabbi Nachman said, don't mention me as Nachman ben Simcha. His father, his father's name was Simcha. Not like the Sephardim where they have their woman's name Simcha by the Ashkenazim. They call men also, they call men Simcha. So he said, don't call me Nachman ben Simcha. Call me Nachman ben Fege. Why? Because he said to invoke his mother's merit is very, very great. So mentioning his name plus his mother's name is a great way to invoke his merit. Already this concept of mentioning tzaddikim's names to invoke merit is a big thing. There's a book which was written by Rav Nossin based on the introductions he received from Rabbi Nachman called Shmot Tzadikim, the name of tzaddikim, where Rabbi Nachman teaches in his Olivet book that by just mentioning the names of tzaddikim, you actually invoke their merit. That's crazy. You think about it. You say the name of a tzaddik, you're actually invoking their merit. Why? In the letter combinations of their name, let's say Shimon Bar Yochai or Rabbi Nachman Ben Fege, those letters, Nachman Ben Fege, Shimon Bar Yochai, whatever it is, in the letter combinations is activated the light and the merit of that tzaddik. It's crazy. I mean, there's levels. Of course there's levels. But an initial level of activating a tzaddik is just mentioning the name. Just mentioning the name. What did I do? I didn't dive in. I didn't do like uh, Kabbalistic meditations. I didn't do an actual activity. I did a verbal activity of just mentioning the name. And boom. It's enough to activate the merit. That's why it's a big thing saying names of tzaddikim. Yes. As opposed to all the vulgar language we've done in our lifetime to now rebalance it to the holiness it's appropriate besides davening a lot and doing Torah study also use your lips purify your lips to mention to make mention of the names of the tzaddikim so he says Rabbi Nachman mentioning the names of tzaddikim is so powerful that it can it can even change the the ways of nature the shanot maase bereshit the shanot etatema person can actually change nature when 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 you, when you want to invoke to activate a type of miracle which is a supernatural so making mention of names of tzaddikim is a big thing people who mention a lot the names of tzaddikim especially who use the book put together by Rav Nossin called Shemot HaTzaddikim the names of tzaddikim can attest to seeing a lot of miracles in life a lot of a lot of big miracles Rav Leo Chaim Rosen he once told Rav Chaim Kramer that he took upon himself when he started becoming the, the guy in charge of building the Breslov Shul and Yeshiva here in Jerusalem in Me'ah Sharim, he started saying every day Shemot HaTzadikim because the miracles needed for funding such a project had to be supernatural to do so. So he used, said on a, on a consistent level the names of the Tzadikim as a big, big thing. Hashem. So now going back, we said earlier that Rabbi Nachman in his book, Chaim Moran, suggested he mention the name of his mother instead of the name of his father. Being that, his mother, Fega, she was known as a prophetess with Ruach Kodesh. Her two brothers, all three, grandchildren of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov had a daughter whose name was Odel. Odel, by the way, is not a Yiddish name. Odel, Aleph, Dalet, Lamed, is taken from a verse in the parsha we're going to be reading on Simchat Torah. Vezot Abracha. Mimino Esh Dat Lamo. From Hashem's right hand, He gave to us Esh, a fire, a, 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 a Torah, a religion, of a, a fire, written on fire, Lamo, to, his, to us, to his nation. So Esh, Dat, Lamo, a fiery religion, Lamo, to us, to his nation. The first letters, Esh, Aleph, Dalet, da, Dat, Dalet, Lamo, Lamed, that's Odel. We say O, oh, because it's a Kamatz. Oh, you can write it with a Vav, but you lose out the Aleph, Dalet, Lamed, which is the main thing to point out. So the Baal Shem Tov had a daughter, Odell, and she had these three children who were all tzaddikim. Rav Baruch of Mejibosh, Rabbi Nachman's uncle, Rav Ephraim of Sudulkov, again Rabbi Nachman's second uncle, and Rabbi Nachman's mother, Fega. They called her Fega HaTzadika, Fega Nevia. She was a tzaddika and a big prophetess. She had divine inspiration. She was very holy. Her brothers really, really looked up to her. She had the merit of having such a tzaddik, Rabbi Nachman ben Fege. Okay? So she herself was very holy. And Rabbi Nachman mentioned, mention my name and as the son of my mother's name to invoke my merit whenever davening for me. So today, Breslaver Hasidim, uh, when trying to daven anything, Rabbi Nachman suggested in the Kutim Moran lesson two 
that before you dove in, attach your prayer verbally to the tzaddikim, which is the custom of before davening, aside what's written in your siddur. If you have like a chassidic or sfardi siddur, and you have l'shem yichud kucha b'richu, you, you have a little prayer say before shachrit, before mincha, before arvit, before doing the lulav, etchog, before lighting the Shabbos candles, before doing kiddush Friday night. There's what's called the l'shem yichud. The breast lovers have the custom to add, in addition, I hereby attach in my daving shachrit or mincha or arvid or birkat amazon or svirat omer or bikidush levana whatever prayer you're going to be doing any blessing you're doing i hereby attach myself in this prayer to all the true tzaddikim we're not going to go so much into it you can look at this concept in lesson two of liquid moran or if you're not at the level the abridged liquid moran the Nachman explains the idea of attaching your prayer to the tzaddikim so based on that the breast of the chassidim have the have been accustomed to saying I hereby attach myself through the shacharit or saying the tikkun aklali, whatever it is, to all the true tzaddikim in our generation. And all the true tzaddikim were passed on. And in particular, this holy tzaddik, the tzaddik foundation of the universe, the flowing book, the source of wisdom, and they say, Rabbeinu Nachman ben Fege. Okay, it's custom to say his name. Fine. So now, that's on the revealed level that Rabbi Nachman revealed to us why he should be called and mentioned today after his passing as Rabbi Nachman ben Feger, as opposed to his father's name, Rabbi Nachman ben Simcha. Let's go study for a little, okay? okay? When we say Nachman ben Feger, there's a symbolism here. There's also a symbolism in Nachman ben Simcha. Nachman is similar to Menachem, which means a constellation, like Noach also. Noach was called Noach because like the verse says, This one will console us from our toil and struggle that we've been doing. So the idea of Noach, Nachman, Menachem, even, even the Midrash Rabbah suggests the connection between Noach, Nachman, and also to Menachem, is the root of all three is the idea of consolation. So when you say Nachman ben Simcha, the idea is a consolation born out, ben means the son, the born out of joy. Consolation joy. I like that. I need a consolation out of joy. I need that. That's something which makes sense. But if Nachman said, greater and more powerful, is Nachman ben Fege. Fege is a Yiddish term, it's a Yiddish name, which also means the word for a bird. Tzipor, Tzipora, there's a Hebrew name Tzipora, like Moshe Rabbeinu's uh, mother, in Yiddish would be called Fege, Fegele. Fegele is a bird, okay? So Rabbi Nachman, the son of the bird. What in the world, what is the symbolism here of a bird? If you notice, a bird, a normal bird, is always moving, always on the move, always on the go. And the normal uh, place, habita the habitat, the habitation of a bird is on the trees, on stalks of grains, of whatever stalks of grass, high grass. That, that's where the birds normally are located. But also the point that the birds are always on the move, doing stuff, right? You see the small like hummingbirds or the small, what's it called, the, the, the seaport drawer in Hebrew. You have these tiny birds, which are kosher, by the way, and they're always hopping around and jumping around. Okay, birds in general are like nervous. They're always moving and they never seem calm. You never see like a calm bird. Normally they're like always on the run. There are exceptions like the owls that like, you know, they're hunting birds and they stare and they take their time. But no more birds that we have contact with, even like especially the kosher birds, they're always moving and moving and moving. It's like unbelievable. Sometimes you see a pigeon on, on a road and you're so scared for the pigeon to get run over. And right like, like last second, he's able to fly away from the car. Sometimes it doesn't happen. But the idea is that birds are always moving and moving and moving. So, so what is Rabbi Nachman telling us on a deeper level? Nachman ben Fege as opposed to Nachman ben Simcha. A consolation born out of a bird as opposed to a consolation born out of joy. What's the idea? Rabbi Nachman, he teaches us if you are sad and depressed and broken, you got to do something about it. If you just choose to sit down and be lazy and depressed and fall into it and wait for outside help to come to save you, it may come, but you're going to be waiting a long time in life. And you could accomplish much more if you try to do something about it. Ibn Nachman was very into action. There's a breast of teaching oral tradition that Ibn Nachman said, Emunah is in the hands. In other words, you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm a Jew. I believe, I believe. If you don't do and fulfill, then your belief... It's not there. Belief is doing. You can't say, oh, I believe in Hashem and you don't keep Shabbat. I believe in Hashem and I don't put on tefillin. I believe in Hashem but I don't fulfill Tarat HaMishpacha, the laws of family purity. I'm sorry. Your belief has to be in action to prove that you really believe. Come on. 
Oh, I believe. I believe in God. I believe in the Lord. But you got to do, man. If you don't do, you're just lip service. We don't accept your belief. Yeah, but I want to believe. Sorry. Until you don't make a physical movement towards your belief, we say X. You're still in potential format, and we don't give you consideration until you stop being a little kid and make the move. Yeah, but, but, but. No buts. You have to do something. In Kabbalah, it's called Itaruta Diltata, and it arousal from below. Rabbi Nachman himself said, I can only help a person who comes to me and tells me what he needs. You have to make the initiative. You don't say, okay, Rabbi Nachman, I'm here. Give me your, give, give me your best. I'm here. Let, let me, let, just do, do it for me. He can only help you. Tzadikim can only help you if you make an input. You have these people, they go to graves of Tzadikim and everything, but they don't keep Shabbat, they don't do this, you know. What's your input? You have to do. It, fine, going to Tzadikim is already an action. It's amazing. But still... You have to now further it. You have to show that I want a continuity. I want something to happen. So it requires that you're doing something. You do a commitment that shows your emuna of following the Torah. Period. Come on. Torah, observance, and the emuna are together. You can't you believe, and my, my performance is all the way down there. I'm sorry. It has to match. Your level of emuna has to match your level of Torah observance. Okay? That's how it works. Fine. So Binachman, his thing is you got to do. Not just talk and talk and talk and sit back and wait for this to happen. You got to do. You have to make a movement and action. The person who's depressed says, yeah, but what do you want me to do? I don't know what to do. So because that Rabbi Nachman gave advice for everything, even for being happy, prerequisite for being happy is he gives five prerequisites. Tell jokes in order to get in a happy mode. Put on music, dance, you know, sing. Find your good points. Give thanks to Hashem. Look at the bright side of things, how everything in the end will turn out to be good. Do activity to work on being happy. Don't expect the consolation of joy to come about from joy itself. You got to be a figure. You got to be a bird. You got to hop like a bird is always moving. The movement of a bird, by the way, so the birds are not depressed. When a bird is depressed, like they're dying. You see sometimes that like a dying old pigeon or a bird, they're not hopping anymore because they're sad. They're about to leave. We, on the other hand, we have to hop and dance. You got to make movement. You can't just sit back and expect things to fit in by itself. You gotta be a Ben Fege, a son of Fege, of a bird, and not Ben Simcha and wait for the Simcha to come. So this in a nutshell is why Rabbi Nachman pointed out, mention me as Nachman Ben Fege, even though his father was an outstanding tzaddik, Simcha, the son of Rabbi Nachman Hordenker, no higher level is Ben Fege. Because Rabbi Nachman's concerned, you gotta do something. You gotta do something to get out of your sadness, and lethargy and depression and everything. You gotta do something, okay? You gotta just sit down and wait for it to come. You gotta do something. That's why I said, mention me as Nachman ben Fege, that the consolation Nachman should come about through Fege, through being a bird, moving around, okay? Chirping. There was a breast lover of Shmuel Horvitz from the previous generation. When he would be walking on the streets here in Yerushalayim, they noticed his lips were always moving like a chirping bird. He's chirping and chirping like a bird. And they asked, what, what was he doing? So he was always doing his bodedut, always talking to Hashem, okay? Rabbi Leo Chaim Rosen, one of the breast liver leaders, also previous generation, he had towards, towards the end of his life, he was very sick, he was bedridden for about four years. And he couldn't even learn, couldn't do anything. And he would tell people, what would I be able to do now in order to be strong and happy if it wasn't for Yidbo Dedut? If I didn't have Rabbi Nachman's advice of Yidbo Dedut, I would be like so depressed and miserable just lying down in bed all the time. He said, but because I'm, I'm able to just talk to Hashem with my lips, even slowly, like a sick person. Master of the universe, help me, right? He said, that's the only thing I can do now to connect and have every reason to be happy that I'm able to do something for Hashem. So again, Rabbi Nachman's thing is Nachman ben Fege as opposed to Nachman ben Simcha, okay? That's stage one. Stage two, how does this relate to Sukkot, the festival of Sukkot, okay? The schach, take a look above my head. You have here the schach, the holy schach, okay? The halacha calls schach, in other words, the, the Gemara term of what schach is, because the Torah says schach. What is it? So the, the, the definition of schach used by the Gemara and the Mishnah is called psolet goren vayekev. The leftovers from the wheat stalks, like the straw, and the yekev, the winery, in other words, the grape vines and the grape leaves that you don't, you just take out, you pluck the grapes to make wine, okay? What's left is all the grape leaves, 
the branches, the twigs, the branch, the, the actual tree. That the Torah defines, the Gemara says that's the delineation of schach, kosher schach, is anything which grows from the earth and it's no longer attached to the earth and it doesn't receive tumah, which is the idea of trees and branches and twigs which haven't been used yet to make like a bed, for example. Because once you use it, you may turn wood into a bed. You can't use the actual planks of a bed as schach. It's forbidden. It's impure. It has to be in its raw format of being cut from the fields, like going like the stalks of wheat and yakiv. And from there, they learn now that also bamboo and anything which is kosher schach today, you see it's made from actual growing vegetation, okay, that's grown and that was cut off, and now it's kosher to be used because it was never used it as becoming like a utensil or a vessel. It's still the raw, the raw actual item. But again, the sages go out of their way to use this term again and again and again in halacha, in the Mishnah, it's in the Shulchan Aruch, it's in the Talmud, psolit goren vayekev. The leftovers of the gorin. The gorin is the place where they prepare the wheat, the actual stalks of wheat, the gorin. That's where they would store the storehouse, the silos for the wheat grains. So then they, they remove from the stalks. So you have the psalm, the leftover, the straw and the hay. Okay, not just giving it to horses, but you can use it for schach. And from the yake, from the winery, that they would prepare the wine. So they would bring the branches with the grapes, the clusters, remove the clusters. They have leftover branches, grape leaves, etc. <coughs> Sorry. That is the term used for the schach. Now we know in the sukkah, what makes the sukkah kosher, and what makes the finalization of the sukkah is the schach. It's called sukkah because it's etymologically rooted in grammar to the word schach, schach, sukkah, okay? So that means the main thing of the sukkah, nachon, you have, it's true, you have to have walls, the kosher amount of walls, three walls, or not full, it doesn't have to be four walls, and the Allah goes into how you can have these three kosher walls enough to be valid as walls. And then only after you have kosher valid walls, you finalize the sukkah by putting on the schach. The idea of a sukkah, Rav Nosan explains this beautifully in several places in the Kutu Alachot. The idea of a sukkah or the schach is the concept of having a tzaddik in your life. When you're all alone in your Judaism, all alone, you don't have a tzaddik that you follow, so you're all alone, meaning you have to toil and struggle harder and harder and harder to connect to Hashem, to connect to the Torah, and to develop that connection. Whereas if you have a tzaddik in your life who's guiding you, who you use their advice and guidelines to connect to Hashem, to learn Torah, to fulfill the Torah, everyone's learning Torah, everyone buys art scroll books and learns them, etc. Very nice. But now that connection to develop, and also when the difficulties of life hit, and you don't know where to turn to, whereas if you have a tzaddik in your life, you do know where to turn to, Bezat Hashem. So this like the idea of a sukkah, where you're going in a protective shelter. Hashem, I'm all alone. I don't know what to do. In myself, Hashem, I'm finished. I see who I am, Hashem. I see how I keep on falling in my, in my lusts and desires. And I'm so upside down because of that. And if Hashem, you expect me on my own to make it in fulfilling the Torah, I don't stand a chance. I will give up even before beginning Chas Shalom Hashem. Therefore, what can I do? I need a tzaddik, a tzaddik who has shelter. I take shelter in the tzaddik. It's not like an excuse. Oh, you can do what you want, I go to the tzaddik. No, 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 no. The tzaddik doesn't accept people like that. He kicks them out. The tzaddik expects one thing from people. What is that? Their honesty and their sincerity and their desire and yearning to come closer to Hashem. That's the main thing. They could be the worst sinner in the world, but they want to change. I really do. I just don't know what to do, Hashem. I want to be a better Jew. It's not like I'm not trying to do nothing. I don't know what to do. So such people, the tzaddik has room for when people have a raton, have a desire, that is the biggest gift, the biggest okay check mark of life. And in that, he has a vessel to eventually advance in life. He has the basis of a good, honest, sincere desire and yearning to connect to Hashem. That's the basis. That's the barometer. Without that, a person who's haughty, oh, okay, I know everything and that, and I can do what I want, the tzaddik flicks that person out. It, it doesn't work out. Even if he does try to come close to the tzaddikim, the true tzaddikim, the truth can handle this type of uh, attitude and the person eventually gets kicked out, okay? It's like the sea can't, like Rashi says, the sea can't hold anything dead in it. So to a tzad, he can't hold someone who has a lot of honeyness and, and thinking he knows it all and he's there on top. So why don't you come to the tzad, everything's okay and you're just looking for, uh, 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 what's it called, the catch-22, a quick way, you know, have right connections to get where you want to get to. The tzad, you know, don't, don't last with such people. It just 
or he leaves them, or they leave him, but it doesn't work together, okay? So, going into the sukkah, Rav Nosel explains, it's like a person who enters the wall and protection, the schach, and it's made from what? From nothing. <laughs> it's like a solid roof, like a bomb shelter. It's nothing, it's a joke. It's a joke. Rain can come through, it seeks right through, okay? The idea of the schach being a protective force, it's spiritual dimension, okay? So, going back, what's so unique the sages pointed out Goren, which is the, the storehouse, the silos for wheat, and Yekif, which is the, the winery press. What's so unique that they chose in their wording, again, the wording of the sages is literally Ruach HaKodesh. Quoting Rabbi Rosenfeld in his classes, every word of the Talmud is directly from Moshe Rabbeinu. People, I saw someone recently made a comment that the Talmud is like the word of man, God forbid to think of such stupidity. Every word of the Talmud, the Mishnah, is the word of Hashem. We have that transmission from Moshe Rabbeinu. With all the arguments, Rabbi Akiva says this, Rabbi Yochanan says that, Rabbi Meir says this, Rabbi Shlakish, that also was given from Moshe Rabbeinu. People who try to detach the Talmud from the Torah, they're now destroying their connection to the Torah. Nothing. Nothing. You don't have Talmud in Mishnah, you don't have Torah. I'm sorry. Nothing. Right? So every word mentioned is divine divine providence okay so so the idea is the question is what's Goin and what's Yaakov what are the two here okay Goin and Yaakov are a hint to two specific individuals Tzadikim but more of a Rebbe and Talmud a Rebbe and student connection to explain the Goin is wheat right it's a stroud for wheat Wheat, when ground, becomes flour. The wheat grains become flour. The Hebrew term for flour is kemach, kemach, kuf, mem, chet. Kuf is 100, mem is 40, chet is 8. Once again, 148, which is gematria, nachman, and netzach, like we said earlier, okay? So, goren is a hint to this tzaddik, Rabbi Nachman. Yekev, now, this is a bit trickier. Yekev is a wine press. What is wine? Rabbi Nachman calls a wine uh, when a person is able to speak and be a good orator to give over, to do in, in proper English, it's called a bard. Someone who is a melitz, who knows how to express things properly. Okay, the verse from Shir Hashirim, Song of Songs, expresses someone who knows how to elo eloquently express ideas. The verse reads in Shir Hashirim, V'chikech keyen hatov. And his palate, speaking of the palate in the mouth, is like good wine, okay? In other words, the speaking of the Torah, transmission, expression in a clear format, it's like good wine. This is quoted in Rabbi Nachman's stories, the story number 12 of the Master of Prayer. In the, it's a long story, we can't go into all the details, and we expect you to follow up. In this story, it talks about a king and the people, the, the people of the king. There's the queen, the princess, the son of the princess, the warrior, the master of prayer, the, the treasurer of the king, the bard, okay? The, 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 the dear friend, companion of the king, and so on. So of ten people, the, the scholar, the wise man of the king. In total, there's ten people, including the king himself. So the, the master of prayer is one of the people of the kings. When, and Rav Nossin, he was the one who worked to put out a, an amazing book of prayers called Likutei Tfilot. What's special about this book called Likutei Tfilot is that these are prayers based on the lessons in Rabbi Nachman's Likutei Moran. In other words, it's lessons which express the ideas and the lessons and asking Hashem to come to fulfill them. There's no other book like that in the world, a Torah book that has prayers written on them, on them other than the Chumash itself. You have, Mujo says, the five, and also the Mar says this, you have the five books of Moses, and corresponding to them, you have the five books of Tehilim. Why the, why the similar number? Because King David wrote the five books of Tehilim to fulfill, davening to fulfill what's written in the five books of Moses. And all, all King David's pleas to be saved from his enemies, with spiritual enemies also trying to prevent King David and all the tzaddikim who helped write the book of Tehilim from fulfilling the Torah. So here you have Tehillim to fulfill what's written in the five books of Moses, and you have also Rav Nossin's prayers, which he wrote to fulfill what's written in Rabbi Nachman's Likutei Moral. When the book came out, 
when Rav Nosen printed finally the Book of Prayers, the Breslev Hasidim were going nuts. They were ecstatic. They were flipping out. And they started calling Rav Nosen, you are the master of prayer. You are the master. Look, you wrote these amazing prayers. You are the master of prayer. Rav Nosen, he refused to accept that. and said, no, 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 no. The master of prayer, if we're going to talk about who's who, so we can hint that the master of prayer in the story was the main focus of the story. It's a long story. You have to see the story itself. But the whole salvation activating the story is due to the help and the merit of the master of prayer. He's the one who got things moving. Okay? So he said, if anyone's the master of prayer in the story, it's Rabbi Nachman himself. Because Rabbi Nachman revealed about himself that the way he reached his high level of perception of godliness and reaching a high level of devotion to Hashem was mainly through his personal prayer, Hitbodidut, and talking to Hashem and expressing himself, etc., 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 okay? He reached his high level, Rabbi Nachman himself said that, that he reached his high level through the simple devotion, the simple, straightforward, honest devotion of prayer. So if Nosen said, if anyone's the master of prayer in the story, refer to Rabbi Nachman. So then who am I? Rabbi Nosen said about himself, I, if, if you want to consider me as one of the men of the king in the story, consider me to be the melitz, the bard, the one who knows how to talk. Because I can find merit in even someone who's transgressed the entire Torah a thousand times and find many, many pages of merit to fill up those pages on the, on the person. Rav Nosso is saying that he will be able to express goodness towards someone else by even if they were so low, as long again as they have the certain points of sincerity and honesty, he could help them in finding a way out. Okay? So this Talmud, this amazing disciple, he connects himself to the bard. So now in the story, the, the Melitz, the bard, there were the other people of the king was in search of the, 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 the remaining king's men, including the bard. How did they find him? They found someone who was sitting in a sea made of wine. Okay? The sea of wine. What was the sea? <laughs> from what was the sea of wine made from? From the words of the bard, of the Melitz. He was trying to console the king on the loss of the queen and the king on the loss of the of the princess and of the, of the, of the baby of the, of the princess. So through the consolation, so many words of consolation, he became, figuratively speaking, made of a sea of wine. And he quotes this verse, like the verse reads, and his palate, <coughs> sorry, speaks words of consolation and goodness, like good wine, consoling, like good wine consoles a person, Technically speaking, it brings a person to be calm and settled and happy and merry and to forget about his problems. So too, the words of consolation do the exact same thing. They create a type of sea of wine. Okay? So going back, Rav Nosen, he said about himself, he's the bard, which is the idea of wine. And that's Yekev. Yekev is the winery. Furthermore, Rav Nosen once said that Rav Nachman was known to pray very quietly. He didn't pray with shouting and screaming. Rav Nosen said, the, the Rebbe told us and instructed us to daven with all our might and energy. It even requires screaming and making noise, as long as you don't obviously bother other people. That's why it's good to daven in the rest of meaning. But anyways, it's acceptable for people to daven loud and clap their hands. Fine. So the idea is to we daven loud. So he gave the analogy that the Zora says. The Zora says, when pouring olive oil, it doesn't make noise. Olive oil, any oil basically, when pouring that oil, it doesn't make so much like gulp, gulp, gulp noises. As opposed to when you pour wine, the wine makes a lot of noise with the splashing, and as it's leaving the bottle, it makes a lot of you have that noise of the wine coming out. So no, wine makes noise, oil is quiet. So Rav Nosen said, Rabbi Nachman is like the idea of Shemen Amishcha, Shemen Mishchat Kodesh, which is holy divine oil, which is quieter. But we, he said, we have to tear our lungs, our throats out with prayers, screaming, like the noise made from wine. So Psolet Goren is the residue, the remnants of the wheat, the Goren, and Psolet Yekev, the residues, the remnants of the winery. Meaning what? The, tzad, the, the sukkah, the schach, which correlates to the merit of the tzaddikim, including the tzaddikim, is the guidelines given to us by their students. In particular, this amazing, outstanding tzaddik that we're celebrating his Hidula today, Rabbi Nachman, and his outstanding disciple, Rav Nosin. So the Psalm by Yekev is we are trying to fit ourselves under even the Psolet, even the leftover residue from the wheat and the wine, it's so powerful enough to even protect us. Yes, even us, as low as we are, 
the psolid, the residue, the leftover stalks and branches from the wheat and the winery, that is what is, it's enough that's needed to help us in getting on in life. This, now to finalize, also explains the custom according to the Kabbalah. It's not an obligation according to Halakha, but according to the Arizal, it's good to say the blessing over the Lulam and Etrog in the Sukkah. You know, in the morning in the Shul, most synagogues in South America don't necessarily have a sukkah attached to them. Now today, Baruch Hashem, more and more do. But in, my, in the time that I grew up, for example, I never never remember seeing this, that people would go out to sukkah to say the blessing for the Lulav and Etchok. People on the spot would open the Lulav and Etchok, say the bracha, and start the Hallel and the Hoshanot with the Lulav and Etchok. According to the Arizal, it's, it's, it's important, and it's ideal, and it's preferable to do that bracha in the sukkah. Okay? So they mentioned, according to the Kabbalah, if they don't have time or a shul that has a sukkah, so do it earlier in your house, in your sukkah, before going to shul, say the bracha. But according to halacha, you don't have to do this. What's the idea? That today, we tell people you need a tzaddik. So most people are like religious, say, where does it say that? Where do you need a tzaddik? You Hasidic people, you start these Hasidic customs. Where, where do you need a tzaddik? It's true. You're not obligated to have a tzaddik. In other words, we have a rav, you have a halachic rav, fine. But that tzaddik that you're just so glued to, and you're trying to do everything in serving Hashem, based on their guidelines and advice. So most people in the Jewish world think that we're overdoing it. The Hasidim are overdoing it and how they're so close to tzaddikim. It's almost like idol worship, God forbid it, but it's not. They admit it's not idol worship. We dive into Hashem. We serve Hashem. Fine. But people think it's overdoing it that you're so connected to a tzaddik. Be yourself. Why do you need a tzaddik? You know, go, go to shul, have your shiurim, learn Torah. You hear the rabbi's sermon once a week. It's enough already. Why do you need a tzaddik 24-7? You know, leave him alone, leave the tzaddikim alone, and run your life. So we say, okay, on, on a sense, according to halacha, you're okay. You have your shul, you have your local rabbi, when questions pop up, you turn to him, you have your, your, your Torah study, no problem, okay? But I, seeing how much I'm in danger, how much I see with a true perspective that I don't stand a chance on my own, I will run to the tzaddikim. So the idea of doing the lulav and etrog, which like the Zohar says represents the weapons of every Jew, I choose to do that in the sukkah, which is in the merit, the protective force and shield of the tzaddikim. And in our context, in particular, these two tzaddikim, corresponding to the grain, the wheat, kemach, nachman, and the winery, the yekev, of nosen, the bard, the melitz. I choose to be under these two tzaddikim and to do things based on their guidelines. I go crazy over the teachings, trying to find inspiration and hope and light. Whatever I'm doing in my personal life, that it should have some connection and some hint in their teachings to give me a consolation and a strength to go on. Nachman ben Fege. I hope all that was clear. It's maybe worth going to this class again and again. Everyone should have an amazing hug to reach Hoshana Raba. We can really cry out from the depths of our yearning and have an amazing Simchat Torah without any pain and atrocities and pogroms like we had last year. It should be an opening for a new year. And like the year is, Tafshin Pei Hey. Hey is very similar to laughter. Ha ha ha! Tafshin Pei, ha 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 ha! Laughter. To have happiness. We had enough already of the dinim of last year. It should be an amazing, amazing year where technically the year starts on Simcha Torah. We start Bereshit already from after Simcha Torah because that's when the year begins. We start reading Parashat's Bereshit on Simcha Torah itself. We just conclude, complete the whole parasha on Shabbat, of course. Already start going from Zodah Bracha into Bereshit, already on Simchat Torah, to show that's when the actual year, the new year starts. We see the Bracha of the new year on Simchat Torah. May everyone have an amazing year, and do your best to connect to these amazing tzaddikim. They've proven to everybody to be lifesavers. Lifesavers. Rabbi Nachman ben Fege and his beautiful disciple of Nosen, use these tzaddikim, connect to them, follow their advice, and again, Ben Fege, jump around like a bird. Don't be still and sad and depressed, but really be positive to have things work out. Have an amazing year full of Simcha. Simcha. Shalom, shalom to everybody. Bezat Hashem. And if you have, I couldn't, I can't really look, read the comments, everything, because of time constraints. Please contact me directly. Bezat Hashem. You have my WhatsApp number.